the Jazz Age, the birth of the legendary Mickey Mouse, and an end to World War I gave the jubilant Americans a reason to celebrate a historic era. The booming economy of the 1920s led to many people investing large amounts of their money with the hope of gain, but with a high risk of loss. These events filled the decade until the economy came crashing down with the Wall Street crash of 1929. This crash made headlines in every newspaper, caused many to lose trust in Wall Street, and forced panicked investors to withdraw their money from the banks, which could not repay them. This led to the closure of more than 2,000 banks and a debt of $6 billion. The aftermath of these events triggered the Great Depression, sending millions into poverty and increasing unemployment. Amidst this economic chaos, one man emerged as a catalyst for change in the marketing practices of Wall Street. His name was Charles E. Merrill. Charles Merrill revolutionized the financial world by democratizing Wall Street and educating small shareholders about participating in the stock market. While working at Burr and Company, Merrill observed that lack of knowledge about investing curtailed the public's ability to invest in securities. Therefore, he decided to market to the middle class customer base, then just to the institutional investors. In 1911, he published an article called Mr. Average Investor, where he voiced his opinions regarding the services small investors received and presented an ethical approach for business. He stated, Having thousands of customers scattered throughout the United States is infinitely preferable to being dependent upon the fluctuating buying power of a smaller and perhaps on the whole wealthier group of investors in any one section. In 1915, with this philosophy in mind, he established his own firm Merrill Lynch & Company with his business partner Edmund Lynch. Throughout the 1920s, this firm controlled and revolutionized the chain store industry. Merrill later founded and invested in Safeway Stores, a leading supermarket chain which shaped the future of American grocery shopping. This experience helped him understand retailing and gave an incentive to sell securities to the masses. To reach out to the common people, Merrill adopted innovative marketing means such as creating the first ever advertisements for Liberty Bonds and also launching the Family Circle a mass circulated magazine specifically distributed to women which contained articles about budgeting and managing finances. From Charlie Merrill's perspective, it really wasn't about um, raising funds for big businesses. It was really about um, uh, the average American being able to participate in sort of this fantastic growth that uh, uh, we were creating. In 1928, as the bull market rose higher, he predicted the crash and paid off his company's debt, liquidating his investment portfolio prior to the actual recession and advising others too. He even pleaded with President Calvin Coolidge to speak out against speculation, but Coolidge eventually ignored his advice. However, those who listened to him averted the forthcoming crisis. This is how Merrill's exploration to democratize the stock market began. In 1939, Merrill and Winthrop Smith together saw an opportunity to rekindle the faith of the middle class investors in the stock market. Thus began their development of a radical and a revolutionary idea, bringing Wall Street to Main Street. And after several months of study, they came up with a new business plan, Charlie Merrill invested in the business. And the new plan was to bring Wall Street to Main Street and therefore bring Main Street to Wall Street. It was to change the way business was done. It was to rid the firms of conflict of interest. It was to gain the trust and confidence of the average American so the average American would feel comfortable investing in the stock market. To achieve his goal, Merrill shared power with Ted Brown, Louis Engel, Winthrop Smith, and he negotiated with the New York Stock Exchange and the government which expanded his ideas. He learned that people with modest means could provide a lucrative customer base and soon introduced merchandising and advertising to the brokerage industry by opening offices in smaller cities across the nation. First, Merrill hired Louis Engel, an advertising and promotions director at Merrill Lynch to develop a strong advertising program that Merrill advocated for since the beginning. 
Engel knew that it was crucial to educate the public about how investment worked and began publishing articles in the New York Times that later received critical acclaim. One client even wrote, God bless Merrill Lynch. I have been wanting to know this all my life. I owned stocks and bonds and I never really knew what I owned. The effective communication technique gave Merrill Lynch a positive reputation in the eyes of investors across America. Next, Merrill met Ted Braun, a public relations expert who surveyed opinions about the fairness of the financial system, who came up with an unorthodox compensation policy that would eventually pay stockbrokers direct salaries instead of a fixed commission. This policy essentially signaled investors that the brokers would not sell them faulty securities, but securities that could be the most profitable to the customer. Merrill later stated, I think that of all our policies, this is the most important one. Lastly, one of Merrill's most significant partnerships was with the New York Stock Exchange when they announced the monthly investment plan. Essentially, the plan allowed people to buy stock on installment in fractional amounts each month, thereby simplifying investment for them. The executive Ruddick Lawrence of the New York Stock Exchange described this as an idea for democratic capitalism, the conviction that Americans everywhere should have the opportunity to own their share of American business. This clearly matched Merrill's rhetoric and he became an avid supporter of this plan. These encounters influenced him to solve the financial gridlock that prevented Wall Street's access to all Americans. Merrill was convinced that financially literate individuals would be willing to invest and focused on exchanging valuable investment information with his retail investors. He did this by actively campaigning and giving seminars about investing throughout the nation. He set up childcare facilities so that both husbands and wives could learn. In addition, he even pitched tents in county fairs and held contests that gave away stocks in a raffle. Along with Louis Engel, he published advertisements designed to answer the customers' questions such as what are stocks, what are bull and bear markets, and more. In fact, in 1940, Merrill Lynch became the first Wall Street institution to publish a financial statement that shared their balance, profit, and loss sheets. The analysis of his exchange with his investors proved that he instilled trust and confidence in them. Through this, the small investor felt informed and welcome in the investing world. Additionally, Merrill published annual reports to inform his clients about the firm's key decisions. In 1947, Forbes magazine wrote, As an individual, he has done more to make the business of marketing securities respected than any other person. Merrill circulated valuable investment information and knowledge to make stocks and bonds more accessible as investment vehicles. And why this was important is Merrill knew that a lot of people would be returning from the war. They'd be going into private industry, they'd be earning money, and they need to know what to do with their savings and investments. And by helping them invest in the stock market, that capital was used to fuel the growth of the economy in the post-war years. So the individual investor became a great fuel for the economy that surged after the Second World War. In 1945, only 16% of Americans invested, but now nearly half of the nation invests. He influenced other brokers' firms to make the investment world more inclusive, and today many firms have adapted Merrill's principles into their business. Because of his advocacy, today investors have benefits such as access to research, lower trading costs, mutual funds, retirement funds, and more. This is good for America and it's good for our economy, whereby if we can get uh, those to invest in the markets and, be, and help them become sort of educated and aware in meeting their life priorities and goals, then that's better for America overall because that means that the overall wealth and income of America increases and therefore people are not so reliant on the government and programs but more self-reliant upon the assets that have accumulated. Undeniably, Charles Merrill paved a way for small investors to gain profits over time by exploring means to educate his retail investors, encountering financial visionaries and exchanging information with his clients and the future generations of small investors.